Good afternoon. It started well. I remembered what time of day we're on. So, uh, my role uh, is to be moderator. This may be one of the few occasions when I select moderation as a strategy for living, but we'll see how it goes. My main job, obviously, is to be timekeeper, to be an uh, introducer, and to create a platform for the many intelligences that sit in this audience to engage in interesting ways with the many intelligences that we have on the stage. Um, as Fiek was, was, was saying in his introduction, uh, when we started to think about change and think about the future, it's very complicated, it's very unknown, nobody knows what's going to happen. I didn't know this morning when I woke up that I'd burst a button on my shirt, which I'm now hiding behind the podium. Um, but we came back to, to, to three things, really, consistently. We came back to story in all its manifestations, the use and value of story as a way of looking into things that are on the edge of our understanding, the edge of our metaphor. We talked a lot, we kept coming back to how do we go from how do we how do we go from the idea into the manifestation? How do you go from the rhetoric of revolution into the art of the possible of politics? How do you go into the making things happen? And we also came back time and again to the body, to the body of the state. What is the body of the state? What exists in it? Is it porous? What does it keep out? Who manages to hold it? And what is it that we understand through the body more quickly, more quickly, faster than we do through other processes. And that leads us quite neatly to the four people on the stage. So what I'm going to do is introduce them all together, then I'm going to invite them to come up and to give, share with you a presentation. And at the end of that, uh, we'll have a panel discussion and, and, and see where we go to. So uh, it's our job to kind of kick the day off. Um, uh, to start with, we have uh, Sarah Brown and Jess Jones, um, who are artists who have research and collaboration central to their practice. Um, uh, Sarah is particularly interested in how we, we communicate and create meaning uh, through exchange and transaction. Um, collaboration, I think, is fundamental to both people's, both people's work and how their work is developed. Uh, and one of the projects they're working on at the moment, which they will talk about, is a project which is very specifically orientated around 2016. Uh, Fergus O'Cohur is a, a choreographer, a dance artist, and his area of great interest really is how dance is a way of exploring the world that we live in. Uh, in 2016, he's working on a project called The Casement Project, of which he'll talk about. And then Sarah Jane Scaife uh, is the founder director of Company SJ. And one of the things that she comes back to time and time again is to look at the work of Samuel Beckett, the work of the body, what is revealed within those texts. So that's my attempt to give you a brief introduction. So I'm now going to hand over to Sarah Brown and Jess Jones. We're going to begin by reading a letter we wrote and was published in the Irish Times on Thursday, August 27th of last year. Sir, we refer to Alice Hanratty's letter of August 11th, querying what an art project exploring statehood from the perspective of the female body might mean. The project in question is called In the Shadow of the State and is one of nine projects that's received funding from the Arts Council's programme as part of Ireland 2016. We're the artists who've been awarded the funding for this particular project. To answer Alice Hanrady's question, this artwork will examine how institutions, laws and practices of the state have impacted on the female body. Since the formation of our state, women's bodies have experienced and endured the deeply physical impact of state ideology. Thus, this has included industrial incarceration, the Magdalene laundries, obstetric violence, since visiotomy without consent or admission of wrongdoing, the legality of marital rape until 1990, and reproductive injustices, too many horrors to name. We look forward to working with experts from law, medicine, material culture and music over the next year, as well as engaging with women's groups and communities of interest in Ireland, Northern Ireland and Britain to further explore and critique statehood from the perspective of the female body. 
Yours, etc. Sarah Brown, Jesse Jones, Glasnevin, Dublin 9. In the Shadow of the State is a co commission by Create an Art Angel and receiving funding from the Arts Council Ireland. Through a series of four events, the project will explore how we perform the state, from the domestic to the institutional. Our four sites are located in Derry, Liverpool, Dublin and London. Each event has two components. A private legal drafting session with invite, within an invited group followed by a public performance. We see the law as performative, a theatrical activity that can operate as an infrastructure of domination. Our law is shaped by the political reality we inhabit, but it can also be a tool to shape that sphere. There is a magic to the law that operates through the body and its speech acts. How does the law resemble theatre? Well, it presents us with a stage. The architecture of the courtroom presents all bodies as available to judgment and possible incarceration. A principal actor is the judge, who is, as Judith Butler describes, one who does not originate the law or its authority, rather he cites the law, constitutes and re-invokes the law, and in that re-invocation constitutes the law. The judge is thus installed in the midst of a signifying chain, receiving and reciting the law, and in the reciting echoing forth the authority of the law. The performative speaking of the law and utterance works only by reworking a set of already operative conventions. And these conventions are grounded in no other legitimating authority than the echo chain of their own reinvocation. This masculine caricature of the law acts to isolate the law into the space of the courthouse, ignoring its more intimate and invasive effects. In the Shadow of the State proposes critical remembering and reflecting on the birth of a nation and the tactics and strategies necessary to move from one historical mo moment to another, whether legally or by other means. In order to do this, we must resist attempting to restore the forgotten and invisible histories of women, but instead to focus on reordering the political imaginary altogether. How do we move beyond the present material conditions into a new moment? What political imaginary do we require in order to do this? We think we must first see our reality as entirely strange. We must see the absurdity of present politics, where the programme for the National Theatre commissions 10 new plays, only one of them written by a woman, thereby echoing the wider political narrative where only 15% of political representation in government is by women. Where pregnancy is a state of exception that suspends women's rights and makes our bodies foreign to us, where a child must undergo a baptism ritual in the Catholic faith in order to have a reasonable chance to access state education, where all people born on the island no longer have the automatic right to citizenship, where we must buy our water and no one can afford to get sick. Today, as we discuss collectively the theatre of change, we might consider the inevitability of change. The question we might ask is, who gets to be the agent of change? We don't see the process of making art as a way of representing that change, but more as a way of modelling how we might work and be together differently. In the Shadow of the State aims to intervene in the performance of the state itself through a process of collective legal drafting and vocalisation. This legal speculation discusses and develops the terms of the contract we will accept that defines the end of the patriarchal state. This will be developed through a process of testimony and storytelling and touch with invited groups of women in a private setting and the material generated will be developed into a public performance that happens later in each location. The workings of the law are enigmatic. Cameras are forbidden in courtrooms. So those of us, of us who haven't been inside one tend to rely on fictional and dramatic representations whether on reality TV or cinematic courtroom dramas, for our comprehension of it. Many judicial ideals can't be experienced or recorded publicly anywhere other than a stage. So we're interested in how such public performances of law might interrupt, complement, or intervene in our shared perceptions. In the Shadow of the State aims to examine how our legal and architectural institutions constitute our bodies within the state. In Derry, in late February, we'll launch the project from a private home that was previously subjected to repeated raids during the Troubles. 
How do we create our homes and how do they create us? Can the domestic space exist as the site of retreat from the state and its laws or instead as an origin site of that oppression? This space will be physically and architecturally transformed, mobilising the aesthetics of secrecy and surveillance through the use of two-way mirrors. In this project, we aim to use the latent power of the domestic space and occupy it for activities such as feminist consciousness raising and legal spe speculation from the kitchen table, but also extend it outwards to domesticate the institutions of the state. In the shadow of the state, we'll address how the regulation of sexuality and public health might be shaped by the state and its laws particularly looking at the contemporary resonances of the Contagious Diseases Acts from the 1860s in Ireland and England. This legislation addressed the threat of venereal disease to the health of male soldiers of the empire and permitted the compulsory gynaecological examination by police of women suspected to be prostitutes. The very bodies of women were penetrated by force through this legislation and in effect were treated as part of a militarized zone. In Liverpool, in June, we'll develop a practical workshop focused on these ideas, titled The Truncheon and the Speculum. In this event, material culture historian Lisa Godson will present her research into the vaginal speculum. This will include a deliberation on why certain designs haven't changed since the 1800s, when the instrument was developed through repeated experiments on black American slave women without any anaesthetic. This will be followed by a practical workshop in reproductive health with Catalan Collective Gynepunk. One of the collective describes the approach as follows. This hacker mentality for me serves as a new way to understand the world around us and gives us many tools we can develop and generate our own technologies. We understand our bodies also as a technology to be hacked, from the established idea of gender and sex to exploring the capacity to start researching ourselves to find our own ideas and technologies to help us be free, autonomous and independent from the system. Another member of Gynepunk says, Gynepunk is not a formed collective, it's a riot of bodies. And for that riot, we'll use all the help, complicity, alliances and tools we can find. Following this event, we'll focus our attention more closely on the embodied processes of capitalism in the most intimate aspects of life, particularly obstetric systems. This event will be staged in Dublin in a hospital context, the city where the active management of labour was pioneered through the targeted use of the hormone oxytocin, regulating the movement of labouring women's bodies through hospital wards across the world. This removal of birth from the home setting to engineer the successful tailorization of childbirth in early 1960s Ireland was one of our few industrial innovations of that era. Through this explicit domination of time, our bodies are born into a capitalist state. Statecraft relies on the mystification to, to conjure power. Through our feminist legal exploration, we aim to demystify the state and bewitch the law. In London, at the end of 2016, we will stage a final event in the disused courthouse, the origin architecture of our inherited colonial legal system. We will call upon the voices of the Furies for this sonic performance of the contractual composition developed with our collaborators throughout the drafting sessions. We'll also invite into the courthouse a series of illegitimate artefacts, including the remains of a rachitic pelvis dating from the 1700s and a sheila in a gig. This final event is the hearing of the suppressed and excluded voices from the shadow of the state. Thank you. So did thing thus new la, whatever they said, that's me, hashtag, like, whatever they said. Um, no, ni brin se shin, ni brin se sha. Okay, so how are they So I'm sorry, there's something missing from my uh, little presentation, but that's grand. Vima kan thus new a skylge, kan 
a veid ohs ta arm eventa ern or donanov mar ni minik a vin desh a grindcore coimsher a choreographer coimsher va ern or don tochtoch no shunta sho um so ham harva boyach le arklan monistroch le fiak agus le dominic akahora soch ton desh laurelev i'm very happy to be here today because it isn't often that a contemporary choreographer gets a chance to be on this important national stage um, so I'm very grateful to the Abbey and to Fiach and to Dominic for the opportunity to be here. Um, like I said, I uh, agree so wholeheartedly with um, Jesse and Sarah's work that in some ways I could uh, stand aside and say I just want to follow what they are doing. Um, but I have prepared. Um, I had prepared a little more text, but it hasn't appeared. So forgive me if I'm going to read you um, a quotation from Jacques Ranciere, where I want to start today this elevated intellectual level. Um, he says that political activity is whatever shifts a body from the place assigned to it, or it changes a place's destination. It makes visible what has no business being seen and makes heard a discourse where once there was only the place for noise. In fact, it makes understood as discourse what was only heard as noise. So what I love in this Ranciere quote is that it reminds me of the politics that's already in choreography and also of the choreography that's in all political, social, religious, ideological, economic structures that shape our lives and that what Ranciere calls the police that assigns each one of us a particular place in the world and determines how we are allowed to move in the world and also that excludes and in fact kind of creates a blindness towards certain bodies that are not allowed to be seen in the body politic. And I want to propose today that dance is a form of knowledge, a form of practice and inquiry that can help us to question, to analyze, but also to imagine and to embody new possibilities that allow potential for the bodies to express themselves in different ways. So when I think about a new state, what I'm thinking about are new choreographies, not a single choreography, but many choreographies and the tools that we'll need to make those choreographies so that we can create a kind of hospitable national body politic that welcomes the stranger from outside, but also the strangeness that's already in us. Despite our reputation of being an articulate nation, um, capable of, I think, revolutionary, subversive, creative, resistance, verbal dexterity, I don't think that as a culture we're very good. We have a similar articulacy around the body or capacity for talking about the body. So I'm going to say that that has an impact historically on how certain bodies have been permitted to express themselves and continues to have that impact, but also that blind spot prevents us from having um, the tools and knowledge to be able to imagine a future collective body, how we would like things to be. So I speak of dance as an important resource, and I do so with the zeal of a late convert. Um, I started my professional training in dance at the age of 23, so relatively late. I had been studying um, English at Oxford and had done my MPhil in European literature. So at the same time that I was falling in love with dance and falling in love with the person that I could be because I had discovered dance, and that's important, I was also studying um, Yeats's No Plays, the austere choreography of Beckett, which Sarah Jane knows a lot more about, and also Friel, and in particular Dancing at Lunasa. And what was important to me in that study, intellectual study, was realizing that even in those celebrated wordsmiths, they pointed to the moments where words were no longer useful, where in fact they had to have recourse to the body to express what was important to be expressed. Dancing as if language had surrendered to movement, as if this ritual, this wordless ceremony were now the only way to communicate, as Friel says in Dancing at Lunasa, a play which I saw here. It's as if but actually it's a quotation that I used in the very first piece that I made uh, as a choreographer at the age of about 24. So I like to think about this as if.
there are historical reasons why we have this blind spot around the body. We can always blame the colonist. Um, the 18th and 19th century characterization of the Irish, the Celt, as being wild, untamed, bestial, ape-like, as you see in those punch cartoons, and violent, which you see in cartoons even up until the 1960s and 70s in Northern Ireland. Of course, that's a justification for the colonial power to be able to impose itself and impose respectability order. And it's no wonder that nationalists in Ireland um, wanting to uh, promote Irish independence had an, a reaction and so wanted to, to suggest that the Irish body could be contained, could be self-controlled. And so you have the foundation of the GAA, which uh, promotes a disciplined Irish body, but also an allegiance with the church and its kind of late Victorian moralism, which suggests how a body should be, a respectable body, a self-controlled body, one that's worthy of independence. And we know, of course, what the impact of that was in the foundation of the state, and particularly in our constitution, as um, Sarah and Jesse have mentioned, the assignment of a particular place to women in the home as mothers with limited, very little control of their own reproductive rights. It's also had the impact of interning certain bodies, so uh, the bodies of, uh, that procreate outside of wedlock, bodies that are poor, interned, bodies whose desire for other bodies aren't sanctioned, tacitly sent beyond the borders to be somewhere else where it's legal to be gay. Or bodies that are um, disturbingly nomadic travelers who still have difficulty being included in the state. And we know, of course, things have changed. After the marriage equality referendum, the state is very happy to celebrate its inclusiveness. However, I think it's worth noting, and I am absolutely for it, that the strategy necessary to make the, the referendum be a success was to focus on love and certainly not to talk about sex, what bodies do. And so for me, there is still a lot of work for us to be, to be doing around how the comfort that we feel around talking about bodies. And it's not just only about thinking about movement, because of course, Ireland part now of a big global economy, a kind of neoliberal capitalism. What it requires of its Irish bodies are that they are, particularly the young ones, that they are resilient, strong, skilled, but above all mobile, ready to travel, to be part of that global flow and economy. And so it's no surprise that as part of our Celtic Tiger uh, glowing international moment, we have Riverdance with its army of disciplined, sexy, skilled Irish dancers to promote that idea of a, a globally capable Irish body. And then more recently with Heartbeat of Home, the sort of the, the second version of Riverdance. It's interesting to note that in their promotional brochure, what they focus on is the fact that the dancers come from the, the Irish diaspora. So they come from Australia and America, but also kind of many different countries around the world. So in our moment of economic crisis, we're telling the world that actually our bodies are capable of travel. They're everywhere already. We're already part of your market. I'm not saying this to criticize Heartbeat of Home or Riverdance. I'm actually saying it as a reminder to myself of how easily co-opted an artist's mobility and particularly a choreographer's mobility is to global capital, um, but also to the state, which is trying to stay afloat and viable in that global economy. So, for the past few years, I have been trying to make my own small gestures of change. Let's see. Um, in 2005, I made a film called Match, which is a duet for two men set in Croke Park. Um, and the reason I did that is that I wanted to show Irish people who sort of say, oh, we don't understand contemporary dance. I wanted to show them that they they do understand movement that is emotional and psychologically driven. They watch it all of the time, they just call it sport. <laughs> and this body, this is a GAA body. My mother, my uncle, like my whole family, my brothers, my sisters, my brother's a sports journalist, my other's a sports physio, my cousin is on the ladies football team at Cork. This body is a GAA DNA. <laughs> it's just that I've taken that DNA and transformed it found other possibilities, moved its direction so that it could be a more 
move myself in a direction that felt more hospitable for me and people like me to flourish. Also, I made a film um, in 2010, so after the Ferns Report and the Irish Child Abuse Commission Report, the Ryan Report, that sets a male dancing in a church alongside an altar boy and a woman who watches. And when I made the film, people said, oh, are you trying to be really iconoclastic and subversive by having this almost naked man in a church? And I said, there's always a naked man in a church. He's, he's on the cross in the middle. It's just that we as a culture have absolutely forgotten to notice the materiality and physicality that is in that space. It's absolutely been, even though in fact it's the, the kind of theological kernel of the word being made flesh. So for me, thinking about a new choreography isn't only about invention, it's also about looking at the resources, at the things that have been hidden um, in, the, in our legacy, in the, his, in the history that we already have. So it's about being attentive to what's already there as we imagine new possibilities. And so for that reason, um, oops, let's see, does this work? Yay, it does. So that reason, for 2016, um, I'm doing a project called The Casement Project. So it's with the support, um, it's one of the national projects in the Arts Council Art uh, 2016. It's also, as of yesterday, part of uh, 1418 Now, which is the World War Commissions uh, in the United Kingdom. And for me, it was important to kind of link those two frames in a complicated way. So the Great War, the World War I story, as well as our Easter Rising moment. And the, as the blurb says, um, the Casement Project dances with the queer body of British peer, Irish rebel, and international humanitarian Roger Casement. Um, some of you will probably know a lot about him already, but I'm imagining that there's some of you that don't. Is that fair assumption? Good. So I'll just do a quick, very quick pricey. Uh, Casement was born in Sandy Cove, so not far away from here. And he came to prominence in 1903 when um, commissioned by the British government, he wrote a report detailing human rights abuses in the Congo, where the native population were being abused, mutilated um, in the rubber trade. And he um, also was part of the Congo Reform Association, which uh, came out subsequently with other people to try and change the situation there. As a result of that report, he became internationally famous and was sent again by the British government to South America, to the Amazon, to do a similar investigation on human rights abuses there um, in 1910 and 1911. And he was knighted reluctantly for, his, um, for the report that he wrote then. Um, but Casement, with his experience of colonialism in those situations, had come to see that, uh, particularly with poverty in the west of Ireland, the impact of colonialism in Ireland and so he became increasingly initially a cultural nationalist and then a political nationalist, using his, uh, his international reputation to raise money in the United States for the Irish volunteers, and eventually going to Germany in the First World War to seek their help for Irish independence. He was captured by the British, who knew all about it, um, on Banner Strand on Good Friday, Easter 16, was brought to London, tried, and hanged. Now, because he was so famous, there was a campaign to, uh, of, to have his death sentence commuted. But the British government shared with people like the uh, um, American president um, pages from Casement's diaries in which he detailed his enthusiastic sex with men all around the world. Um, so Casement was hanged. But of course, this suggests to me already how this private body, what bodies want to do, is a matter of state. In, in the months before Casement was hanged, after he was found guilty and before he was hanged, the British cabinet met, I think, three times to discuss whether they should reprieve him or not. And um, the, one of the civil service uh, briefing papers says about Casement, uh, he completed the full circle of sexual degeneracy from a pervert to become an invert, a woman or a pathic, who derives his satisfaction from attracting men and inducing them to use him. So that suggests something about the sexual politics that's, and the relationship between male and female bodies that's uh, implied in that ideology at the time. 
The state's concern with Casement body continues even after his death. Let's see, is this going to show up? Let's go. Yes. So at the National Archives in London, where I've been doing a lot of research, the doctor at Pentonville Prison, where Casement was hanged, describes how he examined Casement's body immediately post-mortem to determine if Casement could have had the sex that he describes in his diaries. He says, I found unmistakable evidence of the practices to which the prisoner in question had been addicted. The anus was at a glance seen to be dilated, and on making a digital examination, rubber gloves, I found the lower part of the bowel was dilated as far as the finger could reach. And even beyond Casement's post-mortem, his bones, which uh, were the subject of state discussion, so between the Irish and the British governments for 50 years, um, as the Irish government were supporting Casement's family to re reinter or repatriate his bones from Pentonville to Ireland. And eventually, just before the uh, 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising, um, the British Prime Minister at the time, Harold Wilson, who was a Labour Prime Minister and probably mindful of Irish working class votes in Britain, um, agreed to the repatriation. But of course, Casement wanted his body to be buried in Antrim, but that wouldn't have counted as an, a repatriation, so he's buried in Glasnevin. So where bodies go is always political. So a number of things have drawn me to Casement particularly when I want to think about a hospitable body. His is a scandalously hospitable, permeable body. He's also a body that's mobile. He never had a permanent home, ne not as a child, and never growing up. In, he's called, at the trial, he's called of no fixed abode. And he even manages, there's a, a detail in his diary where he manages a, a day return from Dublin to London, uh, no, from London to Dublin and back to London again, um, which in our day of, of air, travel, of course, is feasible, but in that day is the sign of a dedicated traveler. He also reminds me that nationalism has to be connected to a sense of international justice, and that we can't think about in this moment of national flourishing, our, our flourishing, without thinking of our responsibility to people who live outside of our borders. And he reminds me that borders are fluid. Born a Protestant, dying a Catholic. British peer, Irish rebel respectable member of society, sexual outlaw. So I want part of that to be part of my thinking. And I want to use dance as a way to communicate and think about the kind of mobile body, the kind of hospitable body that Casement represents. So in practice, the Casement project, and I'm going to wrap up now, is, has kind of five different elements. One is a stage performance that will premiere in London in June the 11th, uh, before coming to Dublin in the autumn and going to Belfast. There is a film which I'm making for broadcast on RTE because it's important to me that a lot of people get to see the work. We're having a day of dance on Banner Strand called Fele Foilte, which is a day to imagining, imagine welcoming the stranger ashore a full day of dance on a place where at least we Irish are slightly more comfortable with our bodies. Um, there are two academic symposia, one on the 25th of February in Maynooth, which is called Bodies Politic, and another, which I'm doing with the British Library in London um, on the 3rd of June, and which I'm very glad that Sarah and Jesse are going to be able to join in as well. And there's a whole series of engagement projects. So, for example, with gay and lesbian asylum seekers in London, um, uh, Project, a participatory project in Kerry, which will be shown on the Fela Folte. All different kinds of ways in, because I want to draw people to the project. And I guess there's a final way, a sixth part of the project, which is talking about it. Because in a way, I want to draw people to the project. But I'm suspicious of myself talking. Because what the body does is what matters to me. And so I'm going to finish today with a tiny little clip of the wonderful dancers in the project from our rehearsals before London. I hope it's going to play. Um, it's made by Draft Magazine, which you might see around the building. Um, it's a wonderful magazine, which is free, and I suggest those of you that are visiting Dublin that you pick it up. Um, but they visited our rehearsals and made this very short little film. Um, before I show it, though, I, what I want to say is that when I showed Match 
um, on RTE. The next day it was discussed on chat shows, or not on chat shows, on, on a um, radio program the next day. I think it was Ray Darcy. And they were discussing what these men were doing dancing on the sacred turf of Croke Park. Um, but one guy phoned in and he said, I have no idea what that was, but I couldn't stop watching it. And for me, to be able to create connections that we are not necessarily able to articulate verbally, but that we know and feel in our bodies, that's something that matters. So, let's see. There we go. <laughs> Hi, um, just getting my clicker ready here. Great. Um, as a theatre practitioner, I've been working with the texts and drama of Samuel Beckett for over 25 years. This work has changed and developed as I've grown older, working with many different social and cultural groups, both in Ireland and internationally. Between 2000 and 2006, I worked on a project directing Beckett in many Asian countries, such as Georgia, Mongolia, Malaysia, Singapore, India and China. The project entailed working with colleagues of different ethnicities and languages to my own, in geographical spaces very different to what I was used to. This experience had a profound effect on how I processed the body itself, of the performer and of the spectator. It also affected how I processed the site where the performance took place. I returned to directing in Ireland with a new awareness of my own country its cultural past, the climate, landscape, and demography of its people. It was as if I was experiencing my own culture from an outsider's viewpoint. My attention became drawn to lives lived outside of the social contract of the city, those marginalized and disenfranchised. In 2009, I watched a drug addict attempt to pick up a cigarette butt from the ground. It was at the end of Grafton Street, Everyone was flying by in a rush. He was bending down so slowly, he was almost not moving, totally in a bubble of his own making. It seemed as if he was immersed in a reality that was in a different time zone to everyone else. What was so striking was that no one seemed to notice him, and yet he was standing right there in their midst. This guy has haunted me ever since. His position on Grafton Street embodied for me the notion of all the differing worlds we occupy, even while we live in the one communal space. Everywhere I walked, I saw Beckett's characters in this new manifestation of the void all around me. The homeless living on the street, the broken and alcoholic faces walking past me, the old institutional and religious buildings that were falling into disrepair as a nation attempted to forget its past. Meanwhile, every day on the radio, the hitherto gagged voices of all those men and women who had been abused and or institutionalized spoke for the first time of lives lived. Every day new details were revealed about the systemic abuse that was carried out by the state and religious institutions, and it became impossible to retain the image of good old Catholic Ireland. The Ryan Report published in 2009 documented this period of time. As an artist, I needed to make some sense of it all, to attempt to trace the journey of those on the streets and behind the windows of institutional buildings in the present as having seeped from our colonial, national and religious past. I had a very clear image of Raymond Keane performing in Act Without Words too, as a living sculpture in interaction with the city and streets of Dublin. By placing Beckett's writings side by side with Ireland's past, as represented by the changing architecture and cityscape of Dublin, I wanted to draw the connection between the live breathing city of today with the traces and signs of the institutions of its past. 
Between 2009 and 2015, Company SJ conducted the project Beckett in the City. This interactive and explorative approach between the writing and the city began with the installation of Act Without Words II in St. John's Lane by Christchurch Cathedral. This living sculpture, which featured the broken and addicted body, reimagined the two characters, A, Raymond Keane, and B, Brian Burroughs, as two homeless people sleeping on the streets, their sleeping bags replacing the original sacks detailed within the text. They were seen, as James Lee from Malaysia explained to me, as two people who were so poor they had to share the one life. Subsequently, the same design was replaced or resituated in many other spaces nationally and internationally. Excuse me. As Act Without Words 2 and Rough for Theatre 1 performed the outside public space of the city, Fizzles, in 2014, took Beckett's writing into the social and private spaces of the architecture of the house. We explored the text through the aesthetic utilization of the performing body, Raymond Keane again, the use of projection, the recorded voice of Raymond, and the architecture, light, and space of an old Georgian house, which was in a state of abandoned disrepair. We worked towards design purity and simplicity in revealing the socio-cultural traces and invisible presences contained both within the writing and the building simultaneously. At one stage in the history of this house as a tenement building, there were 100 people living there. We filmed imagery of Raymond in the old powerhouse in Ring's End and projected the imagery life-size on the crumbling walls of the house layering the past and juxtaposing it with the present as Raymond performed against his projected self. We imagined many possible Becketts in an old, old abandoned houses, living lonely lives, maybe also trying to make sense of their existence through writing, but just never becoming famous. A homeless man had died in this house and there was a rough RIP painted on the wall. In 2015, we introduced Beckett's Women's Voices. My aim for Beckett in, the, Beckett in the City, The Women Speak, was to give voice to the women of Ireland's past through the texts of Beckett's plays, the architecture and space of the house or institutions of Ireland's historical past, and the bodies and voices of the three performers. The plays chosen were Not I, Footfalls, Rockabye, and Come and Go. I was very fortunate to be able to work with Breedney Nocton, Michelle Forbes, and Joan Davis, all three performers were very comfortable with movement and with improvisation. All three of them brought a wealth of intelligence and experience to the project. I particularly wanted voices that resonated from different parts of Ireland and which spoke of lives lived. I was specifically looking for the timbre of the older woman's voice. By placing Beckett's writing in interaction with the institutions of family, religion and state, I wanted the audience to view the writing of the past framed within the institutions of that past, but always remaining conscious that we are watching in the present. Not I acted as the linchpin for this approach. As for me, it reads as a woman howling from the margins of Ireland's past. A woman abandoned by both parents, institutionalized, unloved, abused and punished by a religion that she could not understand, left dumb by a trauma or traumas within her life, so that when she does speak, she appears to vomit out a rush of meaningless psychosis. When I read it, as opposed to seeing it, I wept, as I witnessed her efforts to tell of a life, quote, guilty or not, unquote. For me, not I, underpinned the decision to situate these four plays within the site of the house, not just a house, but the institution of a house. Each of the women in these plays is marginalized, silenced, erased, and is in some way trying to voice her existence through telling, quote, how it was, unquote, or becoming, quote, her own other, unquote. When looking to cite as an important signifier within this project, there were a number of issues that I wanted to address. Ooh, not sure if that's the one. There were a number of issues that I wanted to address. I needed a building or buildings that spoke of the domestic space, an indoor space, a traditionally female space. 
However, I also needed to access the feeling of an institutional space, also occupied by women, but with a sense of being under an overall male control. The constitution itself was very important when making my decision to situate these plays side by side with Ireland's historical past, Article 41 in particular, which concerns the family and the woman's place within the home. I wanted to link this sense of history into the choice of site. In order to get funding for the project, I had to get all of the permissions necessary to work and create within this site and bring the public in for the eventual performance in place before I could apply to the Arts Council. This proved to be enormously difficult, due in part to the consistent process of erasure in relation to the institutions of Ireland's religious past. Sorry. It's quite astonishing how even five years ago it was possible to gain access to some hitherto hidden spaces that remained at convents, laneways, old religious schools, psychiatric institutions and children's homes. Now most spaces have been appropriated by the state and are being developed for educational use or are in disrepair and thus deemed unsafe for either public use or even for filming in. The past, as represented by these spaces, is being erased very quickly. It took months of research and meetings to finally get permission from the Office of Public Works to use the specific building that I chose for the project, the School Colosh the Wirra, uh, was originally six Georgian houses situated on Parnell Square in the north side of Dublin's inner city. In 1931, the six houses were inter interconnected to form the first Irish-speaking post-primary school and remained thus until 2002. Number 25 was home of the Gaelic League, the Irish language revival movement from 1908 to 1933, and the location of a meeting on the 9th of September 1914, where the future signatories of the Proclamation for Irish Freedom, all male, and others resolved to bring about a rising, this room had a very rough sign over it saying Shomra 1916. When I walked through this site, I could sense all the traces of a past I had been trying to access. There was the physical residue from the activity of the Christian Brothers Order who ran the school, hand-painted murals of their pastoral work in the North Pole, Africa, India, faded signage in Irish, Elu, over the corridors, throughout the long, dark corridors, which translated from Irish means escape. I thought that was fitting for a building through which I wanted to reflect a lack of escape for the women who would haunt it and for an Irish audience who would be led through it. The building represents a male, Irish-speaking, nationalist, religious, institutional environment. As I walked through the site, every ghost and trace of the past interacted with my imaginative placing of Beckett's writing. By placing the four women's pieces in this space, I would not have to add any signifiers. It would all be there for the audience as they moved from floor to floor, down long corridors with doors on either side, opening into empty rooms, which held palpable resonances of the past. By projecting quotes from the Constitution and from Beckett's male protagonists onto the walls of the building, I could allow these rooms and corridors to interact both with the pieces as written and their current placement within Beckett's and Ireland's past. In the end, we were denied permissions to use this building very shortly before we were to begin rehearsals. After a long process of negotiation, we agreed to use the building at the other side of the Hugh Lane Gallery on Parnell Square, Built in the 1760s, numbers 20 and 21 Parnell Square North formed the National Ballroom from 1940 to 1980. The ballroom extended the Banba Hall at number 20 and was used by the volunteers in the early 1900s for IRB meetings, concerts and dances. Before we began rehearsals on the plays in question, we spent a week in Colosh the Wirra filming movement sequences. Sinead Cuthbert and I looked to the streets for inspiration for these women. Not the streets of the homeless, but to the elderly women of Dublin's inner city, many of whom had lived through the time period of Beckett's writing life. We didn't want to situate them specifically in time and place, but at the same time give them enough to be recognised as someone's mother, aunt or grandmother. I wanted the audience to view these images as coming from the city to have them encounter external reality through this frame. Beckett said that he did not make up the text of Not I, 
but that he heard every word written as muttered by old women who wandered the country roads where he lived. This is what I wanted to channel. Sinead found a website called Granny Fashion, which was amazing, check it out. Here we found women who could have been anyone's mother, interchangeable in a once mono-ethnic Ireland. Our present comes from our past, of which Beckett was a part, of which nationalism, religion, and institutional abuse was a part, and it is a past which many women living today have survived. Their voices are raised in the process. I wanted to place all of these elements side by side in this old house, to let an audience make sense of it how they would. We deliberated between skirts, cardigans, dresses, coats, and headscarves. The costumes women the costumed women brought to life a world fast disappearing and animated this old building in a disturbing way by just wandering through and focusing on their own thoughts. We were reading their bodies, their eyes, their lives lived, the clothes they wore that other women had worn before them. They acted like a conduit that linked the past to the present. We fell in love with the headscarves. They spoke of that notion of universal that the hats in come and go do. When we rehearsed this piece, we found that it demanded a certain costume. The way the women moved and placed themselves in the space spoke from the dark, almost as if they were seated side by side in a pew at a funeral or at mass. One thing that was very important for me was that we left the length of the skirts mid-calf, that's usually full to the ground. I wanted to see the Irish leg exposed. That lower calf and thick ankle shod in a sturdy flat shoe, opens up a place in my heart for all the Irish women of that generation that I knew, who had very hard lives and yet managed to keep going on their sturdy legs stuck into sensible shoes. Since 2009, Company SJ has built up a very tight working team of artistic personnel and performers, our producer Kate Lennon, to work on this project Beckett in the City. We've also developed a very strong relationship with the institutions of the city, such as Dublin City Council, Irish Theatre Institute, the Office of Public Works, the Arts Council, and the Dublin Fringe Festival. This relationship has been what has enabled us to create such challenging work from within the changing social, architectural, and institutional spaces of the city itself. We have placed Beckett's writing in interaction with our city, its past and present, highlighting a period within our past and present that needs to be hi highlighted and examined. Finding that period within Beckett's writing and our past, placing them side by side. Although the spaces we have used might change, I believe the traces we have left behind will remain in documentation, in the minds of the audience, and also hopefully in the decisions the city planners make concerning the future usage of these spaces, which hold the precious traces of our past. It is vital that these spaces are not erased or sanitized for cultural consumption before the artists have had a chance to carry on an essential dialogue with the past in the present. Thank you. There is uh, somewhere some microphones floating around, I think. I have to check the time. So we're okay for a few minutes. Um, uh, what I'm, uh, firstly, thank you. That's obviously the, the very first bit. Um, thank you because I know that, that uh, you're all in the middle of uh, making something, working on things. And so to be able to talk from that place is, is, is difficult and also, very important to why we wanted to start this particular session with, with people in mid-creation. Uh, and uh, what I don't want to do is to sort of tie it up and you know, wrap a bow on it and fix it, because I think what was common in all of your conversations really was about porousness, whether it's going back to the past to go forward to the future, whether it's uh, trying to work with different people. You've three of all got uh, pieces of work that are developing that don't have a singular location. And I just wondered whether or not talking about porousness or, or maybe making it more concrete, um, 
why the decision to try and work in more than one location? I'm gonna, I'm gonna direct it to you two because you decide you quite often work on your own independently. And this time around, why work together? Why try and do things in more than one site? And also I'm gonna give you both the mic. Um, yeah, I suppose we, when we had initially thought of um, collaborating together, we'd wanted to work together for quite a long time and we were approached by um, Art Angel. So the work actually began with a UK commissioner and it was the first time they commissioned an Irish artist, two Irish artists to work in a project. So I guess the kind of centre of gravity was never located in Ireland. And I, I guess for myself as an artist, I, even though you know it's incredibly important where I come from culturally, um, yeah, I, I often make work outside of Ireland and I find that that kind of mobile centre of gravity that Fergus was talking about is, is very significant um, in terms of thinking about practices and thinking about creativity, that you're, you're not bound by one location, um, that your imagination is, is a kind of porous and mobile thing. Um, I think it's important to the project as well that it's... Um, it didn't feel appropriate to us to take on these concerns as in one body, in a way, that it is a discursive process that needs to be shared between the two of us. So from the beginning, there's a kind of a delegation of a lot of roles and an ability that what the thing is, is constantly under discussion. So there's a responsibility there to keep the ideas alive, but it's um it's not kind of contained within one person's body either you know that it's there's ways of ventilating it and it's quite unusual i think jesse and i we typically work on our own with other people this time there's this other collaborative stuff happening we often work with film this time we were very clear we didn't want to do that we didn't want to work with visual things in particular it's quite an unexpected trajectory i never thought i was going to be here in in many different ways. So yeah. I guess it's about more generating the situations where unexpectedness can happen as well, um, rather than making a thing that's an object that is static. Okay. Um, create the opportunity for the unexpected to happen, uh, which is what you've been doing really by, by going to a fixed point, going to a text, picking out from the text. And porousness within that is a, is a consistent for you? Is it, what are you learning at the moment? Where might that take you? Um, uh, porousness is everything to do with a Beckett text because a lot of the time, um, you know, people think of Beckett as very uh, intellectually fixed and very abstract. Um, and what I really believe is that is, he's not. It's like everybody or everything can find a way. He can, he can find away through anybody, any space, and it's, it's more the form that's fixed in, in a certain way, um, the idea, the, the uh, argument of the piece, but actually that's why the whole work I did in Asia, it changes everything, because you s put the text there between two groups of people and ask, what do you feel, what do you, what do you see, what do you hear from that text, and I can guarantee you it's not the same thing in any two spaces. And that's the exciting thing about it. it. It's a way, the porousness creates the future communication or the future ideas, uh, yeah. And which leads us kind of neatly into something that was there in Fergus is about the porousness between that process of making artwork and the world in general. And I wonder whether you might pick up on that a little bit. Well, I was thinking about porousness having been possibly one of the people to have introduced it. Porousness is very important to me. However, I think there is a challenge with porousness. My job when I'm choreographing, um, I'm not a choreographer who tells the dancers what to do. Um, my job is to create an environment, to create the structures that make it possible for me to be surprised because I have no interest in going into a choreographic process to see reproduced in front of me what's already in my head. I go into a process with a set of questions, of things that I think are important, with people that I think are important and creative, and try and create the structures for them to generate possibilities. And I think when I'm thinking about a new state and a future, it's about thinking, not about thinking about a particular choreography or a particular way of being porous, 
but actually about a particular way of thinking about ourselves, our bodies, how we work together, um, having a set of tools of analysis that I think are available to us in I've come to in dance as a way for helping us to think differently. So um, in a way, I'm, I'm struggling with the idea of porousness because I, I think it's something that I appreciate because I think I come from a very structured background. But I think for other people, being able to control their borders, the borders of their personal body, is very important and something that needs to be protected. So I think, and in a way that in this political moment, thinking about who we allow into our polity, whether it's our European polity or our national polity, how we police our borders is hugely contentious. Um, but I think we have to be able to learn to think about it in those particular ways. So it's not only about uh, numbers and legal situations and kind of draft legislation. It's about people and bodies. So uh, there is enough, I think, in the last hour and, and a while uh, to line us up the rest of the day. One of the things that is notifiable and noticeable in all of your work is that you know, your collaborations are incredibly generous. I'd like to thank you all for being generous with this. Uh, Sarah Jane Scaife, Fergus O'Connor, uh, Jesse Jones, and Sarah Brown. Thank you very much. Thank you.